Welcome to the Merliand. I am Dominic Machado, and I am joined by my cousin across the pond. I'm glad I get to say it today, Mark Machado, and by everyone's favorite Sri Lankan sports journalist, SL, uh, Estelle Vasudevan. Um, today, we were not planning on hosting a podcast. We were not planning on talking about the LPL till the LPL season was going to start. But because we are dealing with Sri Lankan cricket, we have an emergency on our hands. So we're coming to you with an emergency podcast. If you're listening, give us a like, a subscribe. If you're listening on a, um, see, watching it on YouTube, subscribe to us and give us a like. Thank you for following us and listening to us. So we really appreciate it. This is very, very important though. So um, over the last three days, we've had an auction and then a whirlwind um, sort of 48 hours with accusations of match fixing, the termination of a team, all sorts of things going on. So Estelle and Mark, you're going to help us talk through what exactly is going on. So Estelle, I'm going to you as the person on the ground in Sri Lanka. Can you give us a brief summary of all the action that's kind of happened over the past 48 hours? Yeah, so the first thing that happened, I think, was the news coming through that the current owner of the Dambula franchise had been arrested uh, on corruption charges. And then I think a few hours later, we got to know that last season's owner was also arrested. Um, there have been lots of, I think, conversations about whether, you know, these owners that are coming through in the LPL are legit and, you know, what what their motivations are etc etc but this is the first time we've seen something actually happen um and i mean it couldn't have come at a worse time i think with with the world cup coming up and slc kind of building up towards that and wanting to take the lpl to the next level now we've gone through a few seasons you know we're building up and trying to establish that tournament in the in the global calendar and then for something like this happens i think it's it's kind of a massive blow isn't it yeah absolutely and i, I want to go to you mark as someone who has been beating the drum for the past four years about the quality of the product of the lpl of saying that it's an up-and-coming league as sort of the league's number one supporter and, and fanboy how have you reacted to this news about both dumbala um owners being arrested criminally and then the termination, or at least we heard as the termination of the Dumbo of Thunder as it is currently constituted, but the fact that they're still going to try to run the tournament and have it be entertaining and lively. I'm absolutely devastated and gutted about it, Dom, because firstly, on on, on, on the on you know on a granular level, I really do enjoy watching drunk and domestic cricket. I think it's actually I do think it's a great product. Obviously, you know, I famously say it's the best franchise league in the world, which I kind of say tongue in cheek, but actually it's it's a good league and it's best can be quite competitive. We've seen it's had a really positive impact on the national side. So many players now have come through it and it's, and it's only four years old, have, have started in there and have gone on to have careers in the national team and also gone on to have careers out with you know, the, the LPL and, and start playing in franchise leagues across the world. So the ILT20 always has about 15 shrunken players in. We've had, what, six or seven players in with, um, IPL contracts this season. You know, we can talk about, and and it's you, the story of Veerskant ended up playing for IPL finalist Sunrises is, is absolutely incredible. It's uh, totally uh, due to Jaffna getting a franchise and the, and the work that they've done as well. That's been a massive part of his career trajectory. I thought the next, or what I was hoping would, was that the kind of ownership structures start to stabilise and eventually the IPL owners start to, to invest in the league and buy teams and run it and they become almost like nursery teams where players, shrunk, young shrunken players would, would play this league and graduate on to playing in the other leagues and, you know, they'll get opportunity and they'll become better players and, and eventually will, will, will be a direct pipeline into feeding, not just getting into the national side, but the national side being highly competitive in, in 
major T20 tournaments. And it kind of looked like that was going to happen. I did think, though, it's a little bit odd, four years in, and none of the IPL owners seem to be sniffing around any of these sides. Um, a lot of talent's been taken um, out of the league to the IPL and to and, and to other to other teams that they run, but not much in terms of you know. To me, it's a bit of a no-brainer. If you own, if you're part of CSK, why not buy? Why not take a look at the Jaffna franchise? If you know, if you if you own the Delhi Capitals, why aren't you buying the Colombo side and making it the Colombo Capitals or, or or whatever? But you know. That seems quite far away. And then the news this week and the way that draft went and then the um, what's happened around that Danbury team just seems like it's further away than ever before. And and the LPL is making headlines around the world, around the cricket world, for all the wrong reasons. And it's it's another kind of embarrassing moment for, for Sri Lankan cricket. And none of it is due to players. It's all due to... To, to kind of the administration. I mean, SLC have, have put out a lot of statements this mm-hmm. week and kind of, you know, rebuffed any accusations of, of, of whatever. Um, but it just doesn't look good for... And, you know, I don't think, the, you know, the SLC, SLC themselves have, have taken these owners on board in good faith. And I don't think, you know, they maybe might not be at fault for it. But the the reality is, is it's just not good PR for for Sri Lanka, yeah. right? Yeah, I I hundred percent agree. You know, I thought um, some of the lack of IPL interest might be due to timing. If there's not a fixed spot in the calendar, then it can be kind of hard to sort of say, okay, we're going to invest money when time has to be found. There's not time already carved out for it. But uh, what's happened? over the last few days has made me think maybe there are deeper reasons. Um, And and Mark, just to kind of follow up on it again, um, I know you've done some research and kind of one of your lines is follow the money. What have you learned about the type of people who um, own franchises or have owned franchises in the LPL? What kind of associations do they have? Is that is that something that you see as interfering? So let's talk about what you need to own an LPL franchise, right? Because if you want to own an IPL team, you need to basically have access to to, uh, billionaires to be able to have that kind of money that you need to buy into the the IPL. It's quite, you know, you need to be a lot less rich, but still very, very rich to buy an SA20 SA team or an ILT uh, uh, team or a team in the Major League Cricket or a team in, in the CPL, which are kind of the other, I suppose, major franchise leagues that we're kind of competing with. To buy a BPL team, the Bangladesh Premier League, you need to be a, a multi-millionaire. To buy an LPL team, at this point, you basically need to have a million dollars. You need to give SLC $500,000 um, as a kind of, to, to be the owner. But you also have to show to them that you've got $500 to spend on that team because that's how much they reckon it will cost to run the side. Um, they also want to show that, you know, you're not put, you need to show, demonstrate to SLC that you also have other money as well. So they don't want you to kind of remortgage your house um, <laughs> and, and put every single penny you've got in it to 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 be able to afford it. They, they obviously discourage that. The other thing about, um an lpl side is that they're very specific rules around how many people can own a side so i think i think it's limited to three uh kind of three groups to uh, can or three partners can own one team which is why the jaffna stallions ended up being rebranded because they had i think they had about 12 owners and that moved uh is now owned by a much smaller group and some people had to leave and and all that they didn't like the running of that because they didn't think it was good governance there is a reasonable kind of governance in place in terms of them doing a background check on you, but there is no kind of fit and proper persons test, which is probably something that I look to bring in after the, the debacle around what's happened with the Dambler ownership. Um, I, 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 I spoke to people at SLC quite often about how they source owners for this, there was some question marks over the owners of the candy team, B Love as well. And B Love actually, I think the day before the auction, put a statement out talking about how certain people had, had moved away from the franchise because they were involved in uh, in money making schemes that uh, SLC didn't deem to be appropriate for the owners of the league. So there is some kind of I want to, I want to say, kind of ethics and moral check behind it. Though it is quite, 
it, it's a it's a bit difficult to actually find out what those actual checks are. And as we've seen quite often now, it tends to be after the the transaction of owning the team has been done that mm. any of these checks and balances seem to be in place, which I mean SLC aren't are are guilty of not putting in rigorous enough checks in place to see how these teams are are, are being funded because at the you know franchise cricket's been around quite a long time now and there's a lot of established people who own uh, groups that own cr- uh, cricket teams and it's absolutely incredible to me that we still expect four years in two or three of the teams to kind of change ownership quite frequently um you know one of the previous owners of the Dambula side is, is is a relatively well known businessman in the in the British Asian community in London, and you know he a lot of people I I, I know me and me and that person have a number of mutual friends uh, or mutual connections I should say, and everyone who knew, knew that person kind of was like he's he's a very upstanding member of the community and you know a wealthy man and a successful man and a man who knows how to do business. And he's somebody who who gave up his franchise effectively after one mm. season uh, because he didn't think that the governance was was in place that the league was heading in the right direction. So, you know, it's it's kind of disappointing, and that's where while maybe SLC aren't responsible for for an owner being arrested necessarily, they do need to put better governance in place to make sure these situations do don't arise. Yeah, that's a really informative answer. I think giving us a sense of what it takes to be an owner, what kind of things it requires, and then putting the changing owners in context. So Estelle, I'm wondering, do you think this is kind of the extent of the rot that's going on? Or do you think the rot goes much deeper and we're just kind of starting to see the initial um, layers of it in the fire or sort of the termination of the ownership of this um, Dumbola side? I mean, it's a really interesting one because, like I mentioned before, there's there's always been a few questions about, you know, some of these owners and from where, what the purpose of them owning LPL team is and things like that. One thing I am thankful for is that it there has been some action taken because it could very well go in the direction where you know nothing is done and it mm-hmm. just becomes a league for fixing or whatever and you know goes goes down that route but the fact that there has been something done for people who they they think or they have investigated with regards to corruption i think that's a, that's a step in the right direction uh, who's to say right whether there is more to come uh, I wouldn't be surprised because you you never know with the amount of you know fixing and betting that we see around the world and so many betting companies being involved as sponsors etc. I wouldn't be surprised, but I'm glad that at least action is being taken at this point. And so, Estelle, if you had to kind of. I'm not going to use the word bet because that would be a, a bit out of uh, a bit out of touch there. But do you think this um, LPL will go on as scheduled? Do you think that we will have all five teams com- competing? And do you think it will run for sure? Or are we just kind of hearing, oh, well, we're trying to figure it out and fix it. And then there'll be a slow kind of um release of well we don't know if we can get the proper people to come in and so we have need to cancel it and it's not fair to the fifth team um, what do you think the chances are that the tournament goes on and um, finishes as it's supposed to i definitely think it will go ahead um the news from slc is that they are still they are they are in the last stages of confirming a new owner for dambula i mean i i I'm not sure how far that is true or what's going on there, but I do think at this point they will find a way to make it work with the fifth franchise because it just, um, yeah, it, it just wouldn't make sense not to carry on. Um, lost his- I don't know. Maybe there could be an option to push to push the tournament back a couple of a few months that might be an option they look at because we've obviously had 
the LPL in the latter half of the year as well. So that could be something they look at. But I, I think it will definitely go ahead. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that was surprising is, right, so we've had all this news of corruption, right, changing owners, potential terminations. And this all comes on the heels of what seemed to be a very, very strange auction um, that had some people talking about potential fixing or potential issues based off of the way that the squads were selected. Um, so Mark um, and Estelle, we all kind of closely followed what was going on at the auction. Um, Mark, what was what was surprising to you? What what happened that was kind of unexpected for you in the auction? Well, I think the kind of the headline for it would be is that Sri Lanka's opener for the T20 World Cup that starts in what six days time was or seven days time was left without a team after the first round after he's had quite an exceptional five months uh, start to the year in international cricket. And I think there was players who we assumed were retired who've managed to find themselves being picked up for, in, and in a couple or at least one instance for quite a lot of money. Mm. Um, and it's, it's kind there's a lot around, obviously, auction, player auctions are quite a weird situation because we don't really know how teams want to play and what, what value they place in things because that kind of depends on the on the kind of cricket philosophies and styles that you want to play. But it's really difficult to make an argument for some of the prices that some of the players are going for and some of the values that some of the players were placed on it. I think that Paterano, who was who's been the best player in the IPL from a shrunken perspective become the, the the most the the most valued player the most expensive player i think he's saved a lot more blushes um because if if he wasn't and it was somebody who we thought had retired recently then i think that would not have been a very good look for the league and for for Sri Lanka as well um I'm of the opinion, just going back to some of the stuff that Estelle was saying and what you talked about, I think that Sri Lankan cricket has as much match fixing and as much problems with gambling and betting as every other cricket culture and team in the world does. But I think the problem is, is that Sri Lanka is a place where people expect that to take place. So they look for it a lot more. And when the discourse happened, when, when, strange things happen in and around Sri Lankan cricket. People always point to corruption and, and match fix and allegations more so than they would do if it, you know, if it happened in the hundred or if it happened in the, in the, in other franchise tournaments around the world. And that's the thing that if you are a person who is involved in any way with cricket in Sri Lanka, you need to be conscious of as well. And I also think, you know, there's allegations that are made that people speak about relatively openly in Sri Lanka um, that could quite easily, for the people who, who these allegations are made against, could be battered away, pun intended, um, with, with the kind of, you know, if, if people conduct themselves in a slightly more transparent way. Though, you know, that said, some people involved in some of these transactions have tried to come out on social media and have tried to justify their picks. And, you know, who who knows? Who knows why, why certain players are selected? The thing is, is once you've got a team, once you've bought a team, once you have the ability to to be on that auction table and decide who to, who to to bid for, there is a bit of me that it's like, well, it's you know, at that point, you've bought your place at the table. You can do whatever you want with your money. It's your money. But what is the bigger goal here? What is the bigger aim? Is it for the benefit of you know? Is it to to create a league, a vibrant league that is bringing through young players and giving young players opportunities to get into other leagues and to play national team cricket, or is it to to benefit your mates? Yeah, and people and that, you know that, well. That's a really important point, right? So the player, the the certainly retired player that Mark was talking about was Isra Odana, who fetched a hundred thousand dollars at the U.S. dollars at the auction. And what was strange about it was. Um, the opening bid was for 30,000 and then um, it got jacked up all the immediately to a hundred thousand. 
which is kind of surprising. It doesn't seem like very sound um, betting strategy or auctioneering strategy. And um, we talked about Patham Nisanka. In that first round, Dimuth Karuna Ratne was, was bought for $10,000. You're telling me that some team wasn't thinking that Patham could very easily provide what Demuth provides for just a little bit more money. And in the end, the team that that bought him, Jaffna, has a ton of talented openers and top order batters. So they clearly were a bit confused and thought, OK, well, we might as well try to snap him up for $40,000. They probably didn't bid thinking it would be um, a bidding war. But I think one of the things that's uh, surprising, right, sort of this the, these weird decisions aside is who got left out. Um, and so Estelle, could you tell us a little bit about some of the younger local players who have a ton of talent who probably should be one of the, you know, 50, 60 Sri Lankan players in this league that were left out? Yeah, actually, for me, the biggest surprise was Tarindu Ratnayaka, the ambidextrous mm -hmm. bowler. I thought he would have been snapped up as you know, a certain starter for one of the five yeah. teams. Um, just, I mean, when you talk about ambidextrous bowlers, you a lot of people think it's okay or gimmicky thing. Okay, he can bowl with both arms, but this guy's actually performed well, right? I think most recently also he's been doing well for Sri Lanka A. So he's yeah. had that kind of form also. He's done well in the LPL in the past, so it's very difficult to understand why a player of his caliber is not being picked. Because, I mean, if you really think about it and you really look at the squads, you can't tell me that there's no space in those five teams for a player of his quality, right? Yeah. Um, especially because he's kind of, he's a bit of a proven performer. The second guy I, I would think of is Movin Subasingha. He is different from Ratnayake in that mm. he's not yet a proven performer, right? He's a guy who you know has potential. He's a guy who can hit the ball well. And we saw a bit of that in the previous season. I think he played yeah. for goal last, last time. So he's a guy who you pick on potential. Um, so those were a bit... and. Kusal Janit Pereira didn't get picked, did yeah, he? Yeah, didn't get picked. Which to me is, Sri Lanka is not a country where you have like so many players who can clear the boundary, right? Yeah. So to have I mean, two, two like weeks him, ago, we, we were having a conversation about why he's not going to the World Cup. World like, Cup, exactly. Should he have gone yeah. to the World Cup, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, to come back to Patumne Sanka, right? It's absolutely, I mean, it's ridiculous to think that no one went for him. And like you yeah. said, Dom, in the end, Jaffna was like, you know what, if no one's taking him, we might as well pick him up, even though we have like three or four different opening options, yeah. right? Because, I mean, people are going to look at his, I know there are a lot of people who just look at his overall stats and say, oh, he has a strike rate of 120 or 115 or whatever. Uh, he's still a very slow starter. But over the last year, he's shown how he's changed his game, right? And this yeah. is where I think players also, it's why, it's what makes a lot of players insecure is that someone like Nisanka, he's changed his game and he's really become that guy who shows a lot of intent Maybe not the, you know, he's not uh, Travis Head, right? But he, right. he he's a guy who is, from where he started, he's he's changed a lot, right? He's grown a lot. He's changed his game to adapt to that kind of fast-paced cricket, right? And then you don't get picked in your local league, which, like you said, I mean, with due respect to Dimut Karnaratna, he's... I don't think even half the opener that Patum Nisanka is, right, currently in T20 yeah. cricket. And Candy was a team that could have bid for him in the first round and didn't. And by the time it came to the accelerated round, I don't think they had the budget to go for him. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. There are a lot of names I, I put down, even, even amongst overseas players. I thought there were a few yeah. who, guys like Curtis Camfer, Rishad Hussain, who, who did really well against Sri Lanka in the most mm -hmm. recent series. Tanuka Dabare is another one 
who yeah. we were talking about last year when it came to the World Cup, right? Close to the World Cup. He was a guy who was doing really well in those selection tournaments. Um, so, all in all, just, I would say, a really disappointing auction because, like Mark mentioned, right, you, you there should, uh, part of this is also growing the game in Sri Lanka, right? If not, there's no purpose to having a league of your own. And when you have young players being sh- being shown that, oh, if you don't have the right connections, you're not going to get a good deal. Uh, that's really disappointing. Yeah. I, I, I remember at the back end of la- the, the last tournament we had, I think we talked about maybe it's time for another LPL side. Maybe it's time to expand the tournament a little bit. I do, like, almost as a separate kind of conversation, I do think at some point they need an extra team. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, Dimith, like, God bless him. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a great player. Yeah. He's a legend of Sri Lankan cricket. And hopefully he has an absolutely fantastic test career ahead of him. But even he doesn't think he's a T20 player, right? Like, yeah. he, no, he it's didn't unbelievable. Play last year, right? He didn't play for yeah. half of last season, I don't think. Yeah, the fact that you wouldn't pick KJP <laughs> over Dimuth makes no sense. I mean, I guess it makes sense if you're beloved Candy, right? Because we heard that. When Indo is um, did not want KJP in the the T20 side, so maybe that has something to do with it. But yeah, it, it's very surprising, and I think the two players, Estelle, that you you were three players that you pointed out, um, Thurndu Radnaika was in the sort of three squad small training group team as World Cup preparation, right? Like he was seen as one of the 45 best players in the country. And that no one would take a, a chance on him, right? And he performed very well in that tournament. He took yeah. a four wicket haul, he took a two wicket haul. I don't really know what the reason is for going away from going away from him. Uh, the other bit with someone like Moen uh, Subasinga, right? As you said, power on the island is very rare. He is one of the few guys that kind of hits effortless sixes. And you would think that he's someone that every team would want to have in their squad and train up and retain and keep for a long period of time. And then uh, Thana Kadabare, right? Someone, a, a powerful explosive opener going unsold seems absolutely ludicrous to me. Um, and that was another thing that kind of shocked me. Looking at the sides, they seem to be very unbalanced, like either batter heavy or bowling heavy. There's not really good balancing in the sides. And I wonder... Um, the extent to which the World Cup is play, has played into this, um, a lot of captains of former sides have now switched teams and are not mm. um, are not in Sri Lanka, but they're in the U.S. training. So how much insight did they give or help did they give when they were saying, OK, you need to go and find a guy? And, and was it, say, new owners and new analysts coming in and trying to figure out what to do and then being kind of perhaps overshadowed or out influenced by um, agents, right? Because I think that's sort of part of the narrative is some of these teams look like um, they are made up of players who come from or are represented by certain agents. And this is not the first time that's come up as an issue in Sri Lanka cricket. And I think with the players out of town, certainly their voices would have been heard Uh, more strongly so how going forward can I I just can I just make one other point that there is a little bit of precedent for players who you think should be selected for the domestic leagues to not get selected that's that when they started the SA uh, 20 Temba uh, Baruma didn't get picked up by uh, I I don't even remember this and and basically um, South Africa cricket had to just give him to one of the sides, I think, to, to make it to make him play. I think that's what happened. And he right. was the he was the team twenty captain. But I mean, what's happened in, in in this instance is much more extreme than that, yeah. right? Because he was a player at that time who was who was who was actually out of form, right? right? And and there was kind of cricketing reasons why you wouldn't want to pick him. Um where, you know, if if you compare it, he, he it'd be like it, it's like Nasanka not getting picked first round, right? Or potentially risking not having a team. Um, the sun could, no one bid for him, right? right? Apart from yeah. Jaffna? No, that was the only bid. So, I mean, yeah. if if they didn't bid for him, he would have been unsold, which is 
Absolutely kind of insane, ridiculous. right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's not. Sorry, Dom, you were about to ask a great question, and I just kind of. No. Um, yeah, I was looking at say you know the Colombo strikers lineup. Do they have anyone who is an opener in that side? They have Matisha Patirana, Tisara Pereira, Chamaka Karunaratna, um, Sidira Samarikrama, Donith Well Allegheny. That's Siobhan, right? Oh, they have Siobhan. Siobhan right, he's the only guy. Bas, looks, I think. Yeah, who looks like it? Oh, and Gerbaz. Gerbaz. Okay, they have Gerbaz, and they have Mohamed Wasim who can also open. But yeah, it's still you. The, that team could easily benefit from having yeah so a... i mean if you at this moment if you had to pick between uh Siobhan daniel and patum nisanka to open for you you're probably yeah. picking nisanka right 100 times so. out of 100 right yeah yeah it, yeah just you you look at the, some of the moves and it's just it makes no sense it just looks to me like these people are putting teams together with a the goal isn't necessarily to win the league, mm. to, to win the whole yeah. tournament, right? And that's where I think SLC need to kind of figure out how you get teams in a position. Mm. And as I said, you know, if you bought, if you stump your money up and you put your money on the table, it's your money. And if you don't want to bid for Patan Asanka and you think that you're better off getting Demuth Karuna right now, then that's fine. But no one else in the world thinks that. I can absolutely assure you that, other than the people around that table. Um, and it's it's not really working to the benefit of Sri Lankan cricketers, to Sri Lanka cricket, to the wider product league from a sports mm. marketing perspective. People are not going to be, if, if, if Sri Lanka do well at the World Cup, people are not going to be going, I want to watch a T20 league with Demeth opening the batting. I can absolutely <laughs> assure you that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and broadcasters aren't going to be interested in the product. And yeah, it's a total, it's a total disaster for everyone involved. Yeah. And I'm a bit worried given its proximity to the World Cup that mm -hmm. some of these overseas players hearing this news, yeah. hearing these things are going to say, I'm not going to go play in that league. I'm going to take my time off, have some vacation, mm -hmm. heal up and recover right especially if there are allegations of fixing if there are allegations of impropriety why would you go and risk potentially not getting paid um playing for a league where matches are fixed so i think that this could have bad knock-on effects coming right after a world cup where a lot of players will be looking for the excuse to get out of their prior commitment um, and the last thing you want to do as a league is provide a ready-made excuse for that yeah, it's awful, isn't it? It's just, God, the more we talk about it, the more I've realised it's a disaster. Total disaster. Like, they've got to do something. They've got to mix it up somehow. Get, get yeah, and interested. The, sa the sad thing is it could have been, I mean, already, I think, with this auction and how it went and, you know, a lot of reasoning about, you know, how auctions work. And I think that's fair. Like, if you look at the IPL, people were very critical of, Mitchell Stark going for what twenty five crore? Yeah. Uh, um, I think rupees. a trillion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> like people were very critical of it, and of course, I think you can still say that you know that was a lot of money to pay for a guy who hasn't really done that well or hasn't been at his best in T Twenty cricket. But when you look at like the auction dynamics left arm quick in that situation, the players that people had already retained, all of that, it makes sense that he was someone who people wanted in their squads. But if you look at the LPL auction that they had this time in, in that light, it's st some options still don't make sense, yeah. right? Um, so you can talk about how auction dynamics are different and, you know, they can make you the values of players go up and down but at the end of the day it's also a product that you need people to watch you need them to watch right if people aren't watching it your your money is coming out of if if this is all about business then your money is coming out of the broadcasting yeah. and already i know a lot of sri lankan fans are kind of deflated thinking about how mm. that auction went right and then this yeah. the, the the dambula owner getting arrested all of that so i mean it's disappointing because it could have been something that really, you know, gave another, you know, after four seasons, we've had three seasons, right? Three or four? Four. 
four, four seasons the after four yeah. seasons you you got a big reshuffle in the teams right and after you know jaffna dominated the first three then you had be love winning last time now other teams have an opportunity to kind of rebuild and you know put put forward a proper side uh, so in that sense it was really disappointing and deflating i mean it might turn out that gol is a superb team and isrudana has you know an mvp tournament right and he takes plenty of wickets uh, but just at this moment it feels like we've taken a few steps back. All right, should we leave it there? Um well that's been your emergency pod on the LPL fiasco. Uh we will be back next week with hopefully some more positive talk about the upcoming World Cup. If you made it this far, like us, subscribe us, follow us whatever you're doing and please be um re- please be sure to check out our Mur- Murley and Substack I can't speak at the end of today um, <laughs> and give us a follow there. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye.